see at a sunrise. And uh, that really is the thickness of the atmosphere. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that we can dump stuff in the atmosphere and, and it'll just sort of disappear. Well, the atmosphere is really very thin rime right around the earth. And it's, uh, it's easy to uh, put pollution up there that uh, you really don't want up there. And that's how this uh, climate change is occurring. Uh, in fact, when you fly across the country in a commercial airline, you're flying above three quarters of the mass of the atmosphere. So anyway, the point is, it's not as uh, thick as you might think. Uh, the, this little talk has to do with uh, the experiment a scientist astronaut. Back in Apollo, all the astronauts up through the fourth group and astronauts come on, on are hired in groups. The first ones were the Mercury astronauts and so forth. And uh, the fourth group was the first group that was a scientist group. And the only reason NASA took them, uh, and then the sixth group was a scientist group. I was in the sixth group, the last group of Apollo astronauts. And uh, was that the Space Studies Board or Space Science Board, it was called in those days. Uh, NASA wanted the National Academy of Sciences to support the Apollo program. Remember, a lot was going on in those days, the Vietnam War, uh, the civil rights movement, and as well as this uh, trying to go to the moon. And uh, the, there was a lot of pressure to actually stop the Apollo program. Hey, Tom, uh, let me pause you real quick. Let me make sure I have the right format because I don't want your yeah. presentation to be, because um, I've converted it to a different one, but let me make sure. I All have right, the right one because it's 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 coming in Adobe, but I opened it in Google uh, Slide, and I want to make sure we it have looks fine, but, real quick. Yeah. Was that the correct presentation? Yeah. All right. Cool. 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 All right, then we can just keep it moving. Then I just want to make sure. Um, All right. No, that's fine. Thing. What I was trying to say is that this astronauts in those days were all pilots and NASA just wanted to keep pilots. They didn't want scientists. And it was the National Academy that had forced NASA to take uh, the scientists. And so it was sort of an experiment. And uh, it was, uh, we, in fact, as an example of that, when we got to Houston, the head of the astronaut office at the time was Alan Shepard, the first uh, American that had gone into space. And uh, he walked into, a, we were all put in one room and uh, uh, we, he walked in and said, I hope you guys know you weren't wanted here. And if, if you were smart, you'd probably resign, but I don't suppose you will, so we'll press on from there. And so it, was a, it wasn't really a hostile environment, but it was clearly uh, an experiment. So anyway, the, my experience there is I reported there in 1967, and uh, then I went to all kinds of these survival schools, water survival, jungle survival, Panama Desert Survival, Underwater School, Scuba School, all those kinds of things. And then uh, they sent us to the Air Force to learn how to fly. In those days, all the astronauts had to learn how to fly. Now, now that isn't true. The civilians if, uh, that typically don't fly. Uh, the, they fly around in the backseat, but they don't fly the plane. Uh, the mission site, and then, uh, I, as I said, I spent a, a year in the Air Force Flight School learning to fly. Then. In Apollo 13, uh, I was, uh, the way they assigned the crews in those days, it was uh, nine astronauts to a crew, three prime that are gonna fly it, three backup, hoping the prime got sick, and then three support crew who were sort of learning the trade and they acted as the Capcoms and they did a lot of the testing for the, for the flight. And then three missions later, you'd move up to backup and then three missions later, you'd get to fly. So I was in a rotation, uh, was support for 13, would have been back up for 16 and on, on 19. But when they canceled 18, 19, and 20, then I had no place to fly in Apollo. Uh, and I, as I said, I didn't really get to fly until the shuttle program. But uh, so I acted as mission scientist uh, for Apollo 16, also in Apollo 13. Anyway, uh, and that, that's me flying that second airplane. It, uh, it was, I can tell because of the blue the, the baby blue or the robin's egg blue helmet that was the only one that had one of those so uh i love to fly those planes they were they were a ball okay next slide 
And here I was on, this is Apollo 13, when after they called down, for those who've seen the movie, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, this is the uh, astronauts uh, console in mission control. Usually there's only one astronaut sitting there, but because a lot was happening, we had a crowd there. The guy on the left is Alan Shepard, the head of the astronaut office at the time, and uh, the, our first astronaut in space. And that skinny guy off standing on the right is me about, you know, about 20, 30 pounds ago. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the inset, I was also the one that worked on uh, the CO2 scrubber in the landing module. And here I was explaining it to the, the press after, after our shift. And next slide. And here I'm on, this is me, it's a Capcom console. Uh, uh, and that talking to uh, uh, John Young, who is at House Rock, it was called, on an Apollo 16 flight. And next slide. And I was a co-investigator on an experiment that we developed while I was still in graduate school, and it flew on Apollo 17. It was an electrical radar experiment, really. The moon, because it's so dry, is essentially transparent to radar. And so rather than using seismic, which doesn't work well in the breshes on the uh, broken up soils on the moon, uh, we used the, this electrical system to sound the moon. So on the left there, you can see that's the transmitter. And then the receiver was on the back of the rover, the thing that uh, the crews were driving around. So it essentially mapped everything under, underneath uh, as, as the rover uh, drove around. And next slide. That's, that's them uh, with the landing module in the background and Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt driving the rover. And that white thing on the back of the rover is our receiver. Next slide. I left NASA in 1972. Uh, I had a choice to go to test pilot school, which I really, really wanted to do in some ways because I love flying, but I really like science more. So I went to, I quit this NASA and went to the US Geological Survey for seven years and uh, did work in Antarctica and, and airborne geophysics. That's, that's me down in the left corner of flying uh, the surveys uh, to Haviland Beaver. I had an instrument in it, and it sticks out the bottom, and I was doing airborne geophysics with it. And the, when I was working in Antarctica, uh, we traveled around by motor toboggan like that. We were 1,100 miles from the home base in McMurdo, and uh, here's, here's actually two parties. One of them's my party, and one of them's the guy on the right side of the flag is a fellow named Art Ford. This was his 13th season in Antarctica, and this was just my, my second season down there. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. But anyway, in 1979, I was invited to go back to NASA. Uh, next slide, please. And I flew on the shuttle in 1985. That was the shuttle Challenger in the summer of 85. Uh, next slide. And here's uh, uh, John Bartow and myself uh, on the aft flight deck. We, all of our experiments were out in the payload bay, and so we operated them through a computer interface on the aft flight deck. Next slide. And here we are landing. Uh, at those days, we landed at Edwards because we didn't have that parachute system that they had towards the end of the shuttle program. And also the brakes weren't very good in those days. Uh, Gordo Fullerton was the commander and did a beautiful job of landing. Uh, much better landing than I usually get it when I fly commercial air. Next, next slide. And here's some questions that I often get. Uh, what are the current role of scientists astronauts? Uh, nowadays, in those days, they didn't let us really pursue science. They thought it was, their, our job was to fly uh, spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And so there was no real opportunity to do science. Now, scientists astronauts can do science. And uh, it's a much, uh, because I, I guess the success of, we early ones, uh, now the scientists are appreciated. In fact, there have been scientists who run the astronaut office. And what is the daily routine of scientists astronauts? Uh, it's a combination of training, uh, engineering development, and the science that you're doing, which probably has something to do with space flight. How might future missions be different? Well, missions will evolve toward longer times, and Mars missions will be two years or more. This is like the old sailing ships, they would leave and be gone for, for several years. 
and that will be the way that that the the uh, long those longer duration missions will be. And what will NASA learn from Artemis? Artemis is this going back to the moon. Uh, they've lost the institutional memory of how to go to planets and land. I mean, all of the us that did it on Apollo are retired, are are not even that, not around anymore. Uh, and so they going back to the moon allows them to rebuild their institutional memory about how you go about doing those things. Wow. And what will be the next big leap for human spaceflight? Uh, and that, it's humans to Mars. Uh, staying on the moon is not going to be that interesting, uh, I don't think. <laughs> I may be wrong. But going to Mars is uh, really exciting. We have to learn a lot more about humans in space uh, to do that successfully. And Mars uh, is a planet much more like the Earth than the moon is like the Earth. So anyway, that, that was the presentation and be happy to answer any questions. All right, short and sweet, I love yes. it. Let's go ahead and um, 